everyone, and welcome back to the newest episode of the Scholar AI Founders Pod. Catch us on all your favorite podcasting platforms and check us out on YouTube. As always, thank you for joining us. I'm joined by Shashi and Lakshay, and today we're going to be breaking down some new news in the business world of AI and beyond, um, debriefing some recent news about microplastics potentially being in our drinking water, and also talking about some other things that are specifically top of mind. So hope you enjoy this podcast. And let's, let's start there, guys. Um, let's start with the microplastics and drinking water coming specifically from plastic bottles. I'd be interested to hear uh, your all takes. I've got some thoughts, but I'll wait uh, to kind of share mine. Um, Shashi, you want to start anyways? You're thinking about this or is it changing your behavior at all? Or Every generation, it feels like there's there's a couple of, there are a couple of things that the previous generation did that um, we look back and we think, oh, you guys are such idiots 30 years ago. And microplastics feels like one of those things that, you know, like our, our kids and grandkids look back and they're like, you drank water out of plastic bottles like every day or every week. <laughs> you idiots. So uh, anyway, it feels like one of those things is sort of like smoking 30 years ago, like people used to smoke on airplanes. And um, so, uh, but yeah, it feels like it feels like an, one of those no brainers in retrospect that uh, history will judge us poorly on. Uh, not surprised by it in terms of day to day behavior. Uh, my my kids you know, have been using kind of hardened plastic, but I'm sure you know pretty crappy grade plastic, all things considered. Anyway, um, uh, for like kind of daily bottle use, and I've uh, switched out to to metal uh, based bottles. Um, who knows whether that's you know to to what degree that makes a difference? But yeah, it's minor behavioral change. Yeah, I was um I was lucky in that like my. My dad, I guess, like, he always kind of had this force and was always, like, super, like, health, like, polluted conscious. And so even, like, growing up, like, even, like, frozen foods or whatever, like, we, in the house, we're required, you have to cook them, take them out of the packaging, put them in, like, a glass rubber bowl, and then eat them. You're not allowed to, like, cook anything in plastic. If you put plastic in the microwave, you're being very dumb, so stop. <laughs> um, so I've very much grown up on, like, just, like, I use metal for everything, um, more just by nature of, like, habit and getting used to it. Um, but I guess, yeah, it's kind of, I just said, like, I guess it's not super surprising that that sort of stuff leaks into the, <laughs> the liquid that you're putting right next to it and exposing with sunlight and all sorts of stuff. The elements obviously can creep in. I guess it's not super surprising. Just duh, you know? Yeah, it's, it's very interesting. I, I have two, two thoughts. One is specifically to the way in which the researchers from Columbia went about kind of discovering this, which I think is an interesting note to touch on. And in some ways seems really obvious, but like most things, um, took a while for people to, to get to. And then, um, also have several thoughts on kind of just the behavior, the overall behaviors of packaging food stuffs, whether that be beverages, um, fruit, et cetera, in plastic kind of across the U S and globally. Um, I think that Shashi, you're right. And that we will look back on it very much in the ways that many people do smoking right now, which is kind of like, this is an obvious bad for you thing. Um, and why were you not eyes wide open going into this to begin with? Um, I will say on the counterpoint, in some respect is um, plastic is by nature cheap. And so I think the move towards, you know, packaging a lot of things in plastic made a lot of sense at the time when the primary, you know, concern was how do we drive down cost of goods? How do we enable people to afford these things? And how do we preserve these things? I think that plastic made, made sense. I think that there are other alternatives now that we know about that make a little bit more sense, but that have some problems of uh, kind of increased uh, degradability compared to plastic. So some of the things that I've thought about are kind of thin films that you could wrap things in to help them preserve, but that aren't going to be um, plastic by nature and that aren't uh, harmless. Like one of the things that I think is kind of interesting and I've researched a little bit in my time at Duke is um, a molecule called a polyvinyl uh, alcohol uh, or poly polyvinyl acetate. And basically um, PVA uh, is the same technology that's used in like Listerine packs that you for breath mints or the same wrapping that's in like a, a Tide Pod so you can put it in the uh, washer. Um, and so anyway, they that they are using that as a preservative to wrap things instead of plastic so that it kind of extends the shelf life without any of the detrimental uh, effects of plastic, at least I think. Um, that kind of leads me to uh, a different thought, but along the similar lines is that how the researchers actually found these microplastics in the beverages. I think it's fascinating that they actually took a type of mass spec essentially and said, analyze the liquid themselves itself and just said there are plastics in the bottle before all of the kind of conventional wisdom was to analyze humans and say, are there microplastics in you? And then if yes, what were the implications of that? The problem is we kind of all have microplastics 
circulating in our bloodstream and in various tissues types that we have. And it's very difficult to trace those back to the origin. So we don't really, really know where we were picking up these microplastics. So removing the human aspect and simply just saying, can we detect microplastics in the beverages, I thought was a really thoughtful um, and in some ways obvious approach that hadn't been done before. So I just kind of wanted to applaud the researchers that were driving that effort um, from there. So any any yeah. further thoughts um, yeah, on I, that? Yeah, I'll just add on that kudos to the team uh, that, that did this work. And sometimes the most obvious studies are the ones staring you in the face. Uh, and, and just, you know, the, the core of the scientific process is to observe, uh, capture data and report. And, uh, feels like this is one of those, you know, specific cases. Um, I, and I, I'd, I'd say in addition, kind of microplastics, w- w- plastics come from, uh, crude oil and natural gas, um, the process of energy generation. I had a conversation. I live in, in Texas and there's a lot of, you know, oil people in Texas and a lot of oil, um, and one of the conversations I had was about EVs and kind of the trajectory of, of battery based uh, vehicles and the future of oil and whether, you know, whether the energy industry is specifically the oil and gas industry was in trouble. And one of the, one of the responses I got from you know, people um, in, in that industry was, Oh, well, even if people don't buy gasoline for their cars, they're still using plastic. And that's, that's mm-hmm. where plastic comes from. It comes from oil refineries. And, um, and so it, it follows that. Uh, putting, you know, fragments of, or derivatives of the oil and gas production process um, to into your food or adjacent to your food uh, would thereby kind of contaminate the food with those those exact components. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it'd be interesting. I don't think we're going to move away from plastic holistically any time in the near future, just simply because of cost more than anything, um, right? In some ways, being in the U.S. and being U.S. centric, we are fortunate that we can afford to pay increased price for goods and not have to be reliant on the plastics. But I do think globally, especially, we're going to be reliant on plastics for, for at least the foreseeable future. I'd like to see that shift away into something else, but um, I don't necessarily see a very clear path to doing that in, in the relatively near term. But Yeah, I think there, I mean, I was, um, it's been a while since I've seen like a new one of these, but at least there was a period where like, hey, we're a startup, we make like a seaweed based, like, container for food right like we we take like an organic material like make it into something that's kind of akin to plastic and let you wrap your food in that or like keep water in that the only one that's like felt like it's actually like stuck out in a capacity as being like an alternative container just like liquid debt as like a way to hold water which is just i guess they won more often branding than anything but um at least it's interesting seeing that there's like an example for this ends up in the market and is actually taking up share of its space. Water, of course, being a little bit easier than something like, I don't know, like tofu, but you know, mm-hmm. um, it's at least interesting. Yeah. I actually gave up, we gave up plastics in our house, um, roughly two years ago, I guess now two and a half years ago, uh, more so just out of a kind of a conscientiousness for reducing waste than anything else, but that's kind of paying dividends now with the kind of, again, seemingly obvious conclusion that there are microplastics circulating in those beverages. But um, yeah, in, uh, in any event, we'll, we'll kind of put that on the shelf again. Uh, congrats to the authors on that on that paper and, and good science. So always always interesting to celebrate good science. Um, kind, of, kind of moving on, pivoting, shifting gears quite significantly here. Um, do we have any thoughts with regard to Sam Altman's newest, you know, kind of news coming out about his efforts in AI chip development, kind of setting up foundries potentially here in the U.S. and kind of onshoring some U.S. chip development or or otherwise. Shashi, you want to start us off? It's, it's clear that the bottleneck step in um, technological development right now, specifically Gen AI and, and the development of AGI, lives in alleviating the, the chip uh, and compute bottleneck. And, um, and Sam's, Sam's smart. He sees that. What his economic arrangement is with OpenAI, I don't think has ever been publicized. I'm, I'm not sure. I, uh, I don't. I certainly don't know the details of it. I'm not sure anyone else really does either. I've heard um, anecdotally that he doesn't have a significant financial arrangement, or that he hasn't taken a significant amount of value there where he could have. That that may very well be because his actual strategy, his play, is to develop OpenAI into his own best customer for a chip production. Um, uh, strategy so that I, I could cer- certainly see that strategy. Um, and I know he's raising capital for that and you know, kind of held side by side with um, XAI also raising significant capital for their um, their AI venture, which I'm sure will include some 
hardware investment because that's the, the fundamental building block um, for that kind of technology. So um, it, it's it's fascinating to see uh, that rumor, uh, and if confirmed, then uh, wouldn't at all be surprising that uh, they're going after the biggest carrot there is right now, which is the the compute. Yes, yeah, interesting thought. I hadn't thought about it in terms of kind of Sam always playing the long game, which is to kind of build OpenAI into a customer for his eventual chip startup. He has said um, in numerous talks that I've heard that he actually doesn't hold any true equity in OpenAI. Again, with the whole nonprofit structure um, of OpenAI, I think there are some some kind of oddities uh, that are not similar to the vast majority of other companies there. So I'll leave that, you know. I guess time will tell uh, kind of what happens there, but looks any thoughts with regards to a potential new uh, hardware chip startup? Yeah, I've been, I mean, especially just like over the last like 48 hours, I've just been spending a lot of time, especially on just like, how do I understand like, what are my compute requirements for these massive models? Like if I'm running a production machine, like what's the cost effectiveness of like getting a certain response time? How much can I actually like, put through these systems? And at least from like a lot of the conversation I'm seeing online, there is a sort of like enthusiasm about this like emergent, like third class of chips where we have the CPU. A lot of these models can run the CPU very, very slowly. There's a GPU, which is obviously like you want to run like 4K gaming, like hyper accelerated stuff um, off of this. And then there's this idea that like there might be room for this kind of like middle of the path, like it purely meant for like fast inference, super fast, like throughput, um, that could obviously make a lot of space for, you know, these paradigms that are popping up like agent based services or, um, other like LM driven stuff where it's just, you want the fastest response time for a production based machine that is high compute without all the bloat that a GPU generally has to serve what is a really, really powerful system. Um, and so I'm interested, I guess I, I think inevitably like this, creating a new set of hardware takes time to kind of like bleed into the industry. And I think obviously like Microsoft, OpenAI, Google will always be the first players to kind of like show what can really be done with that stuff. Um, but I mean, if that stuff ever becomes available like sooner rather than later to like smaller companies, medium sized businesses, um, it'll be really cool to see like what that kind of opens up possibility wise, especially since a lot of the current, like a lot of the current environment is very cost permit, like a very cost restrictive rather. Um, it's very, very difficult to run anything in production on your own hardware without accepting like a big tanking cost. Um, and that could change things. I'm, inter- I'm interested in, and you may not have this information top of mind right now, but in, in thinking through what you were saying with the, the potential for a new chip to be introduced such that it is better optimized for this inferencing problem, is that with respect to cost? Meaning that a, a new chip can be constructed such that you would get GPU level performance at a lower cost chip, or are you or are you introducing the idea that maybe an architecture built inference first might be superior to the GPU in some way? Yeah, I think I mean without being intimately familiar with like GPU architecture myself, like my impression is that when you're running with a GPU, like let's say like, as you kind of climb through the scales of like, what is the power on your GPU? There's VRAM, there's RAM, there's like, like all sorts of like disk sizing. There's the like number of GPUs you have on node, et cetera. Right. And as you kind of like climb up the tiers, like all of those scale at about like pretty similar rates, right? Like you go one level up in one, you go one level up in the next one, just by nature of what the, the chip you're purchasing. And so an in inference, like, especially for example, like RAM is something that matters a lot in like how much, um, content you can hold in memory at once. So that's what translates to like your context windows, how much you're able to, um, go back and forth. If you optimize like the RAM a little bit over something like the memory, then all of a sudden, like, Hey, inference is a little bit faster because all of a sudden, like you're able to manage a lot more context for a lot more people at once, um, with any given request. And it's just that sort of stuff where like right now, CPUs have their own set of levers that are like general compute optimized. GPUs have their own set of levers that are like not just inference optimized, but just like performance optimized. And that means a lot of things. Whereas if you get to like tune some down and tune some up, suddenly there's different costs um, that can kind of come into play. Yeah, it's fascinating. I'll have to do some further reading because I just not a world that I don't know kind of a ton about as far as the specific hardware. I mean, my information basically goes as far as to say serial processing versus 
parallel processing, and that's what GPUs are inherently good at. But like you're saying, as far as tuning up and down various aspects of the GPU to optimize them for a specific use case is a, is a fascinating thought that I just haven't thought much about until you introduced the concept. So yeah, thanks for bringing that to attention. Um, speaking of high graphics processing unit kind of capacities, Vision Pro was recently announced, released, all the things. I, I just found it incredibly interesting on the back of these two different um, lawsuits, if you want to call them that. So there was the first kind of this idea that Google and Apple have kind of created monopolies in their app and app stores, basically. And then secondarily, Apple has now had to repause uh, selling of the iPhone, or sorry, of the Apple Watch because of their blood ox, their pulse ox uh, sensor. So I just, in addition to that, with the release of the Vision Pro, Netflix and um, YouTube announced they actually weren't going to build Vision Pro native apps for the Vision Pro. And so I'm just curious to hear your all's response on what seems like a pretty important use case, which is viewing content through the Vision Pro. Um, the two kind of, you know, hallmark names in content right now don't really seem to be wanting to play ball in this new ecosystem. So, Luxay, you want to start us off with us there? Yeah, I don't know what that's going to mean, man. I, uh, like, I feel like that was like the most obvious thing to do. Like, of course, like, okay, we're just starting this like product out. Like, we don't have like a big developer ecosystem yet. Like, the people who would be our first developers don't even have this thing on which to test. Um, so obviously, like, let's start with like the big names. Like, obvious stuff will have applications ready. We'll start like announce their applications right away. And like, I don't know. It feels like regardless of what's going to happen, they're eventually going to have to end up on there. Just like, I guess the space that Apple holds, it doesn't feel like it makes sense for Google and Netflix to not be there. Of course, there's like the whole monopoly aspect or whatever. It might just be kind of like handcuffing Apple a little bit into trying to drop those rules. But um, still, it just feels weird to like announce we're not doing this. Like, I, I can't believe that it's like that binary of a announcement, you know? Yeah, I agree. And actually, it, it strikes me as more similar to Instagram never having built an app specifically optimized for the iPad. I mean, like our app is still going to exist there. We're just not going to emphasize building specifically for that use case over some other interface, right? The browser, the smartphone, et cetera, et cetera. So it does feel like a little bit of a progressive hedge, more so than an outright binary. We're never going there. Shashi, anything to add? I see the, the Netflix and YouTube decisions as really practical and also very short term, meaning right now these AR VR headsets are all hobbyist app, toys. They're not for professional use. They're not used in any wide scale. YouTube doesn't lose anything by not having a YouTube app because there's just not many humans using it. And even the ones who are using, using Vision Pro are still using their iPhone for the most part when they watch YouTube or they're still using their Mac or their PC for YouTube. So the, the number of uses, the, the, the DAO impact, the weekly active, monthly active user impact is so tiny that they lose nothing by saying they're not going to have an app for it right now. So I just see it as incredibly practical and also not really meaning very much because if there were suddenly users on Vision Pro, then they'd be jumping in to make apps. It's, it's just they're going to be responsive to the market. Uh, my my own experience is that I've I've had um, I've had an Oculus for many years now. I've currently currently have the Quest Two. Uh, we use it every week. Uh, my kids and I we we play we play golf on it together, mini golf, and 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 uh, we play the climb where you can climb uh, virtual mountains and buildings, and it's super fun and actually a surprisingly good workout. Um, but two two thoughts on Vision Pro. One, it's got the cord in the back, which uh, I, I just I, I just think it's a it's a non-starter for or at least for me and from for other people in all likelihood because you can't comfortably move around without worrying about you know the cord. Um, the second is the weight. It's just it's going to be too heavy in this iteration, and and uh, it's a wait and see. Even for the people who are um, who are accustomed to the market like me, um, it's it's still just going to be wait and see mode. So I just don't expect them to to sell many units. I watched a promo video, which which looked really cool of having kind of a, you know, big display sitting on your couch, like, you know, big, uh, big screen uh, experience on Apple TV. Uh, I can see some early, you know, kind of fun use cases like that, but really I don't expect many units. I don't think it's going to help their stock price in, in any way in the near term. Yeah, we've, we've spoken about VR and AR before, and I do think there's a path to professional use case in which, like you're saying, Strap on your goggles for your day of work, get an expanded screen, get some kind of an immersive experience, but it does feel like that's further away 
than anything else. And the meta quest, the two and the three that I've tried are very interesting um, gaming devices. And like you're saying, there's some cross between game and fitness there that I think actually has an attractive aspect, but at the consumer price point, right? A couple hundred bucks, not this $3,500 um, massive head weight that Apple is selling. And I think it's probably designed really well, but um, of every review and everything I've seen is, is the key. The primary takeaway is my head's tired. Like this thing weighs a lot. I'm wearing this thing and I'm, I'm tired. And so I, I think the, the reality uh, of people... Have you seen this Max Verstappen like exercise meme where he's like <laughs> he's doing all these like exercises on his neck to like prepare for like the the G forces <laughs> and this is like yeah. the training you need to to be able to use Vision right. Pro. <laughs> but uh, just yeah, to, just to piggyback on the meta piece there, Damon uh, Zuck is killing it right now. He's he's got it. You know he's he's driving Llama three. He's buying GPUs. He's he's still leading the metaverse thing and it's early development, but. I mean, who, if you were going to bet on the metaverse working, who would you bet on Kappa who realizing economic value? It's going to be, it's going to be meta. They're, they're, they've got the app, the, the app developer um, network already. They've got the infrastructure. They've got the headset lead. If you were to bet on one company making metaverse financially lucrative today and you just start with the assumption that's going to work, it would be meta. Yeah, I think that's a fair bet. I think also as an extension of that thought, the other kind of sneaky dark horse I can see in this race, and we've, we've alluded to this earlier on, on an earlier podcast as well, is our game companies. So maybe Microsoft makes a play just simply because the game companies already have the community of people there used to interacting in a virtual space, right? So right now it's for, it's for leisure, it's for play, but there does feel like a natural extension into professional use cases of that. Feel free to push back on that. Just kind the of only downside, on uh, the, the only pushback on that, Damon, I would have is that Microsoft isn't very good at writing code. The, like if, if only they could overcome that one obstacle, I would totally, <laughs> I would totally buy in. <laughs> yeah, fair, fair. Um, yeah, I guess we could, there's some joke in there about Google entering it and then exiting it just as quickly, shipping a product <laughs> and then uh, completely killing it uh, a week later. Um, that's right. That's right. That's funny. Yeah. I think, uh, one thing that's been, uh, interesting at least is like i guess like a topic that i keep on and this is why it's like one of the prompts on the gpt is just like the use of like vr and like professional spaces and like every claim i see to like oh people are gonna start do, like making powerpoints in vr i'm like what are you talking about dude but then there's like this this other category of like you're an actual like your profession is like very knowledge driven but also requires like kind of like a physical capacity and the person that comes to mind it's like surgery right where like i think a VR headset that has really good pass through could be really, really interesting. And in that, like, hey, you're a surgical trainee, or maybe you're a surgeon of 20 or 30 years in the future, where like you have a pass through headset on. And as you're performing surgery, like you're able to see basically like, the inside of someone's body, like in line with all these sensors and MRIs, like providing overlays and stuff like that. Um, and so I think, like, in the idea of like the metaverse, like to me, it feels like meta is going to win that especially since they just like own social um but i think with the current price point of something like the vision pro being very consumer unfriendly i do think that the place i'm excited to see this sort of stuff evolve and maybe appear in some research is like medical spaces like construction spaces spaces where like the workers like the key like players are people doing very physical work but have very strong knowledge bases and seeing what you can do when you're able to access all the information you ever need, like directly through your vision. Yeah, it's a fascinating thought. I haven't thought a lot about it, but I have spent several times, like quite a lot of time in surgeries. And my, my wife is an advanced practice nurse um, in electrophysiology physiology and spends a bulk of her time in surgeries as well. And physicians, to your point, are fairly used to wearing lead and other kind of headgear that is quite heavy, um, that does amplify their abilities during surgeries or protect them, obviously, in the case of lead. So... Yeah, it, it's very interesting. I, I, I do see a pretty clear use case where if you can augment the information kind of in real time, that why that would might be valuable. There's a whole kind of line of inquiry that that opens up with me around like, how would you reliably stream medical data? Like what are the sensors that attach to stream the information in? And it kind of, <laughs> this conversation becomes incredibly circular of like, uh, information is only as valuable as kind of the clean data that you can collect and pour into these systems and lots of advances in my opinion need to be made in sensor technology in order to kind of really reliably do that in the healthcare sector specifically. But, um, you know, autonomous cars are, are making strides. And so in, in the same ways that that's happening, you, you can imagine, um, 
computer vision, uh, making similar leaps in, in healthcare. But, uh, it's a fascinating thought. Fascinating thought. I haven't really thought, um, thought about it, but I, I like it. All right. Anything on AR, VR before we transition to, uh, uh, an outdoor related item? Have any of you guys used Grok yet? <laughs> any impressions of Grok? <laughs> It, it's an LLM. <laughs> it does what LLMs do. <laughs> I like Grok. I, I've had I've had really good experiences with Grok. Uh, mainly asking kind of very real time questions like you know what are you know, sports news for today, that kind of thing, where it can pull from the the, the daily Twitter um, Twitter volume of, of content and give give an answer. It gives the wrong answers too course, but all the LLMs kind of have that, um, that problem. So I have to be very specific with my prompting. Uh, but, um, but so far I've actually found the recency of data available to, uh, Grok to be really interesting and helpful. So I, I prefer not to go to ESPN. I just think it's, you know, a waste of time, but I like being able to ask one or two questions of Grok and it just, you know, I'll come back in like 15 seconds and it's got an answer for me. So, uh, it's a decent use case. I never interacted. I never interacted with it in the like substance of like asking it to like tell me about news or stuff. But it, it sounds like it's actually connected to like the Twitter stream, like the feed. It seems like it to me. Yeah, that's my impression. Huh. Yeah, I think um, like I was watching a like a little like mini documentary about like Twitter and like Jack Dorsey and of course all the scandal and betrayal that that involved. But um, it's interesting hearing how like the founders kind of had the foresight saying like, "Hey, this isn't just like a social." network it's like a news network in its own way and that, that was kind of like a lot of the big bet that the founders made when they bought back assets from their investors before it was uh bring what the company was called before twitter um but it's interesting seeing that play out now um where like an lm is basically reading out to you like the news as it's happening second to second by being connected it does it does feel to me while twitter has its issues and i'm actually liking the experience less than i was say three months ago with some of the changes to the apparent algorithms and things like that, it, it still kind of is the place for the most up-to-date news. And yes, you obviously have a signal and noise problem and you have to be kind of a thoughtful reader and, and kind of consumer of the information. But in any event, no matter what, whether it's sports or kind of political commentary, um, et cetera, Twitter is kind of my go-to place to check things that are happening in real time. Um, basically, if it's not live sports, I'm almost consuming it on Twitter. Um, so like debriefs of, you know, election, uh, debates or, 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 or similar, um, it's Twitter or it's YouTube. Um, it's, and it's specifically like content creators who are breaking down recent events and kind of, you know, summarizing, synthesizing, uh, that kind of thing. So I haven't, I haven't truthfully used Croc too much to kind of ask and get answers back from kind of, you know, the, the Twitter database, if you will, or the X database, if you will. Um, I'm going to try it though. I mean, just based on your recommendation, like I'm going to try it and play around a little bit. I just haven't spent very much time inside of that ecosystem. So I'm kind of interested to try it now based on what you're saying. Okay. Leave that alone. Josh, you want to tell us a little bit about the pebble flow thing you sent over in the Slack? This is not something that I had seen. I just want to kind of hear your, uh, your, your rundown of it. Yeah. When I first saw this, this link pop up, uh, I thought this was pebble, the, the, uh, the watch, the smart watch. Um, and, uh, so I thought, you know, the, the smartwatch company is making an RV, uh, <laughs> no separate company. Uh, this is a, a new RV, uh, electric RV company, uh, there it's called the Pebble Flow. And, uh, it's, um, it's an all electric, um, self powered RV. It's got, um, it's, it's got the, the same battery size as a uh, Tesla model three. Uh, it's got a really kind of sleek, modern design with windows all around and, uh, a cooktop and fridge and anyway, it's a, it's a very kind of lux glamping style RV, um, but uh, looks really cool. My kids, if I had it in the backyard, I mentioned this on our our chat. If, if we had, if I had this in the backyard, my kids would just want to live in it. And uh, I don't know, I might even love them. <laughs> uh, it's it's cool. I mean, if I were a kid, I would want to live in one of these things. Um, it's it's fun. It's interesting. I love that we are taking the what we're learning about battery and tech and moving it into living kind of how we live day to day, things we touch and, and feel and even live inside of. Uh, so I think it's a really cool applications, cool idea. Um, I think it comes out at the end of the year. I, I may pre-order one. I don't know. My, my wife will probably hate it, but, um, but who knows, might give it a shot. 
my neighbor does the the same thing. He not an electric RV, but he just got like a typical RV. And we were chatting about like, oh, do you like take that camping? He's like, anything? Like, no, no, it's just like a play space for the kids. And so the the kids will like after coming back from like Taekwondo for the day or whatever, will just like run to the <laughs> RV and make it into their like personal playground, which is kind of fun. That's funny. Josh, is, is camping something that you all do as a family? Like, is that something that you guys do regularly or something that you are thinking about doing or how does that fit in there? Camping doesn't really fit into my wife's vision of, of our weekends. Uh, my, my son, my older son's in Boy Scouts. So he does a camp out one weekend a month. And, um, and I think if I were to, to, you know, drive out to the camp out and if I'm staying, I might just take the RV and stay in it and, uh, you know, let the kids go rough it out there uh, while I, I live in luxury in the in the pebble flow. I don't know. We'll see. That's funny. That's funny. I think I think I said in the in the chat. I, I camped for the first eighteen years of my life, and so that, that part of my life is is over. And so we, we we did camping quite regularly when I was a child. And um, you know, for better or worse, it wasn't as uh, yeah. I grew up in a very rural part of the United States, and so it wasn't a, a disparate cry from my standard everyday living to be out in a tent or those kind of things. Um, so we have, I've camped in the most extreme cases and I have no intention of returning to that anytime soon. So if I was going to camp in any form of the word, it would have to come with some of those first world amenities that, uh, that, um, I think this is going to feature. So, um, similar to you, I don't think there's any chance I would get my wife anywhere near a campsite unless it came with a ski cabin or some sort of thing like that. So, um, what's well, uh, that's funny. That is a, uh, that's, that's good stuff. Um, yeah, luckily, any, any thoughts on the camping at all? I mean, you do, you kind of are a little bit of an outdoorsman. I don't know if you spend much time other than just recreationally, intermittently outdoors. Was camping something that, that you all do ever? Yeah, I, um, so when I was a kid, we used to camp a lot, like every summer, like going, Oregon's really, really nice in that way where like you can go, you can choose a direction, get a different environment. You can go to like the desert one way, you can go to the mountains one way, beach another. Um, and so camping is something we used to do a lot. I think just like, especially just being like a competitive prestige oriented, like middle to high school or trying to get into good colleges. The the moment like the, the awareness comes down from the, the parents saying you need to start working on like SATs and getting like the GPA up or whatever, um, that all very suddenly stopped just because my weekends were no longer like whatever the hell I want to and more so like, okay, and now it's like prep for the subject SAT and blah, blah, blah. Um, I consider myself like, decently outdoorsy i don't like say i have like a specific hobby i don't like stick to one in particular but i like kind of just like trying a lot of stuff um i went windsurfing last summer i ski on occasion um i really want to learn surfing but oregon's not the warmest place for anything like that um i have been this and marketing just like gets me this way dude but um the tesla cybertruck there's this one like little Oh, there, I'm about to like have like seven threads out of this one thing I'm about to say, but we'll get to those step by step. There was a clip in the Cybertruck like commercials or promos where it was like car camping in like some like bay somewhere. And like they had this like attachment where you like pop open the back of the Cybertruck and you can like see them back, whatever. Like there's some model that someone had that even had like a full like shower or whatever attached. I was like, that seems cool. I'd love to do that like at least once or twice. Um, and the reason I'm mentioning that there's seven threads is that this this marketing about camping and the the ideas of camping and like this outdoorsy stuff resonates with me. The whole reason I went to Australia was one Apple ad for the Ultra Watch just like showed a clip of like this like monochrome diving scene. I was like, that could be me. And so I did it and I went and I got the I got the watch just for that one journey. I didn't even use it. <laughs> um, so I'm very, very vulnerable to the ideas of the outdoors uh, as to how committed I am to different questions. That's funny. Yeah. That is funny. Yeah, that's, that's hilarious. Uh, no, no, no. It's leaving that slightly, um, I kind of taking the conversation in a direction I don't think you necessarily intended, but um, given kind of the all electric nature of the pebble flow that Joshi was describing, given kind of your reference to the cyber truck, we're seeing cold temperatures across the U S right. Um, I think you guys do own a Tesla or correct me if I'm wrong, right. You all, your family does own a Tesla, let's say, and like I drive an all electric, um, SUV as well. So I'm, I'm curious your thoughts basically on kind of the EV infrastructure as it currently exists in the U S especially mm -hmm. in response to the cold. Have you found any kind of, extra frustrations that you felt like you weren't prepared for or that you feel like you're not getting a, a, a positive response to the EV. Maybe just, maybe just download the entire experience of owning the Model 3 in, in general. 
Yeah, I mean, I think the the way like our family generally treats our cars, like they're all very utility oriented. Like, of course, like the Tesla's just kind of like the daily drive. Like, we don't use anything with gasoline. Like, it's convenient for getting groceries or whatever. But when we're having this like winter storm, like the Tesla is basically out of the question. Like, we don't think about it, and that might be different if we did not have like a four wheel drive SUV with snow tires and chains on the ready, right? Um, but I personally like hearing all this stuff about like, Oh, how to keep your EV charge in like winter conditions, whatever. Um, it's not something I would be very, very comfortable dancing with in any capacity. You know, like if I didn't have the SUV, I would not consider going out. If all I had was the Tesla, I would just like stay at home, be comfortable, whatever. Um, the one, the one thing, um, which is definitely not the way you're taking this. The one thing we did do, or at least I wanted to do, and no one agreed to it, was when we had the power outage. The one thing that had power was the Tesla. So I wanted to like go into the Tesla, turn on the heat series, and just watch Netflix in there. But no one joined. <laughs> um, they're lost. I guess. But what can you do? Yeah, that's that's funny. That's another idea that I've played with a little bit too. The Tesla power bank, in the sense that like mm-hmm. heating, it, especially in the warm weather climates, um, you you are kind of defended against power outages, right? Assuming that you have some sort of power reserve there at your house. Um, Mm -hmm. So I was thinking about this. So my daily driver is all electric. My wife has a hybrid. So we kind of also have a gas plus option. So in the event that we can't charge or or whatever, we're not left without transportation. I I do, while I've overall been exceedingly happy with our daily of the, of the EV, I would, I would be difficult, I think, to, to recommend to somebody to only have an EV. It does still feel like you need a gas car just kind of as a, as a last resort, um, in the event that cold spells difficult charging otherwise. Josh, if, if you're here, any, any thoughts? We definitely had a cold spell in Texas and, um, uh, f- funny story. So I'm in the process of build, of, 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 uh, building a house and, um, mm. And, uh, our builder, very nice, uh, group. And the, we, we floated the idea to them like a few weeks ago of, uh, of, uh, putting heated floors in our bathroom. And we got this really polite, really, sh- but really kind of pointed, pointed quip back of, uh, we don't usually get this request. In fact, we've, we've maybe never built one of these because we live in Houston. <laughs> like as if I don't know where we live, you know, uh, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> sort of like you idiot. Like, why would you do, why would you do this? And then, and lo and behold, we get this cold, cold front come in. And, uh, and I got to say to my builder, ha ha, who got the last laugh there? <laughs> so, uh, no, it's, it's been cold. Uh, uh, this is, I'm sure, related to how much, you know, how much CO2 we put into the atmosphere and ice caps melting and global weirding. Um, hat tip to Al Gore. Well done. Um, so, um, in terms of what this what this means, I think it's just all of us need to be prepared and tolerate more um, more weather than maybe we had twenty or thirty years ago uh, in every direction: heat, cold, storm, rain, flooding, etc. So um, I think there's just a, a higher degree of um, of risk and need for kind of agility there in terms of weather events than than we've had in the past. Uh, the hurricane season has been relatively quiet the last couple of years. I wouldn't be surprised at all if the season was quite severe. And um, so that's just another another kind of weather event that potentially looms. Yeah, that's that's funny. Yeah, I would I would have to imagine you're right in that Texas home builders don't often get the request for heated floors, but <laughs> that is funny. And I think I think you're also right to the larger point that you're making that I think that um, individuals and organizations are prepared for the overall increased probability of kind of stochastic weather systems on kind of both extremes. Um, returning to the EVs, you, you do not have an, an EV. Is that right? Josh, is that something that you've ever considered? Is there a reason that you're avoiding them? I'm just curious. I've, I've, I've always had an X5. I've, I've, I'm, my current X5 is my fourth one. And every, every three or four years, I end up just buying another one. It's comfortable. It's, it's just the easy option for me. And, um, the, I know there are now electric ones, so I'll, I'll consider that the next iteration. But, uh, but so far I've just kind of been really comfortable and happy with it. And, and our gas prices, uh, partly are just really cheap. Uh, I think perhaps compared to most of the countries. So, uh, cost wise, it's just, it's just very low. I don't drive that much. I probably drive on the order of, you know, 5,000 miles a year. Or so, um, my usage is just so low that, um, I've just never bothered to, to make that switch. Yeah. Yeah. 
X5 is an excellent car. Um, we actually looked when we were looking at the EV, we looked at the hybrid version of that as well, because my daily commute is significantly less than 30 miles. It's probably seven miles one way. So, you know, you could kind of do all of your monthly driving and never, never touch the gas, but again, still have the gas reserves. And I think there's a compelling argument to be made for going that option, especially for people that are somewhat EV apprehensive, if you will. But, um, yeah, no, no, no real, uh, critique one way or the other. Just kind of curious on your, on your thoughts there. Um, Okay. All right. Well, I think, I think we're at time for today. So thank you all for joining us as always for the Scholar AI Founders Pod. Please remember to leave your comments in the section below and hit subscribe down below. Find us on all of your usual podcast platforms and check us out on YouTube. Thanks everybody. See you next week.